So, so the last couple of weeks we've been doing uh, what we would call a systematic study. So when we talk about systematic theology, we talk about the fact that we're going to pull what the Bible says about a certain topic from all through Scripture, and we're going to systematize it, and we're going to put it in order so that we can understand it. So, so tonight we don't want to do a systematic study. I want to do a little bit of an expositional study. So, so by that I mean tonight I don't want to look at a lot of passages of Scripture. I want to look at one passage of Scripture. And I want us to just walk through one passage of scripture. And, and I really, to be honest with you, expositional study is kind of like my bread and butter. And, and I really had determined that I didn't want to do an expositional study. I wanted to do more systematic. But there's a passage of scripture that is so important to sanctification that I really want us to walk through it this evening, okay? So, so you probably know it's in your notes. So turn with me to Colossians chapter 3. And we're going to study verses 1 through 17 tonight. We're going to study just a larger passage. And Paul is, Paul is talking about this. We spent time in verses 20 through, uh, what is it, 20 through 23 last week. Remember how we talked about, uh, Paul said, listen, don't fall back on rules. Touch not, taste not, handle not, as if those rules are going to help you overcome the flesh. And he ended chapter 2 by saying, they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. In other words, rules don't change anybody, all right? Only the Holy Spirit of God changes people. So I would remind you that the chapter divisions were not placed when the Bible was originally written. The chapter divisions were added later for our help. And so Paul Paul ended his discussion there in chapter 2, and he begins right away. No division, no distinction, no, uh, okay, let's pause there and come back to it. And so he's continuing to talk. And so I want to walk through this tonight. I want to walk through it slowly. I want to explain some words. I want to ask some questions. But I want us to understand what Paul is saying in this passage tonight. All right? So you ready? So everybody have your Bible, your iPhone, something, because we're going to walk through uh, these verses. So we're going to start with the first four. So I'm going to divide it up into sections. Let me just read the first four, and then we'll go back and kind of talk through it. So Paul says this, If then... You have been raised with Christ. Seek the things which are, or seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died, notice that, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, I love this phrase. I don't know whether you underline in your Bibles. I'm still an old-fashioned guy. I still underline in my Bibles. So I love this. Verse 4. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. So, so I've divided these 17 verses up into, into four different sections. So, so I'm giving you basically kind of like a sermon outline today, even though I don't want this to be a sermon, okay? So the first four verses, Paul is talking about the fact that we should live the risen life. That's what Paul is challenging us, that we should live the life of a resurrected follower of Jesus Christ. So, so, so there's one word in the beginning that tends to give some, some ambiguity to the passage, and I want to kind of blow away that ambiguity. So in our Bibles, it says, if then you have been risen with Christ. Probably a better word than what Paul is saying. So Paul is not talking about ambiguity. There's not an, a, a guess. He's not talking about those who maybe have been risen and those who haven't been risen. What he's talking about, he's expressing a reality. And the idea that he's expressing is this. Since you have been risen with Jesus Christ. And so it's not an if statement as if Paul is saying, examine your life to see if this is a reality. No, he's speaking, he's writing the book of Colossians to fellow believers, and he makes this definitive statement. He says, since you have been risen with Christ, he is expressing a reality in the life of 
the believer since you have been resurrected with Christ. So the first thing that I put in your notes is this. Recognize, in order to, to really grow in the sanctification process, you've got to recognize your resurrection with Christ as an accomplished fact. That's profound, all right? Recognize your resurrection with Jesus Christ as an accomplished fact. The, the, the phrase, and we're going to dissect a lot of this tonight, so I hope I don't bore you a little bit with, um, with just some uh, profundity of, uh, of the passage, but, but, but the phrase raised with Christ is a really interesting phrase, all right? It literally means co-resurrected. And so here's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, since you are co-resurrected, with Jesus Christ. Now think about the, the, the depth of that statement. We all know that, that the foundation of our faith is what? Is the fact that Jesus not only died, but that the grave is empty. Three days later, he rose again. And, and his resurrection is the foundation of our faith. So, so Paul looks at those, those Colossian believers and us as the message transcends through time, and he says, since then, you co-resurrected with Jesus Christ. In other words, here's what he's saying. Recognize the fact that you are resurrected. Paul, Paul makes that statement. Some of you are familiar with Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. Paul says this, I have been resurrected with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. As a matter of fact, would you turn with me to Galatians chapter 2? I want you to see that verse. And, and once again, if you mark in your Bibles, that's a great verse to mark, okay? Same thing that Paul's talking about here in in Colossians chapter 3. And Paul makes the statement, he personalizes it in Galatians chapter 1. He says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So, so what's Paul saying? That we died with Christ, and we resurrected with Christ. Now, now that's hard for us to comprehend, because you might sit back and say, okay, Brian, I'm having a hard time with the math here, all right? Because Jesus died and was resurrected some 2,000 years ago, and I was born in 1962 or whatever year you were born. So how is it possible that I died with Christ and that I resurrected with Christ, all right? It, it might not be a physical, biological truth, but Paul is talking about a spiritual truth, that when Jesus Christ died, we died with him. And as a matter of fact, the moment that we trust Christ as our personal Savior, that becomes a reality in our life. So, so, so here's what I want you to catch. Realizing your position as a resurrected saint is a path or is the path to holiness. Does that make sense? All right. I'm glad the air conditioner is on so it doesn't get too hot in here, all right? But, 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 but that's what he's saying. Recognizing who you are in Christ is the path to holiness. You are no longer living the old life. You have been raised in Christ Jesus to live a life of victory through him. That's profound. And so we've talked about tonight, we've, we've mentioned over and over again, that, that it's God who does the work in us, and it's us recognizing what our position is, submitting to him, and allowing him to do the work in our lives. So every day, I wake up with the recognition, I have been crucified with Christ. And not only have I been crucified with Christ, my old man was crucified, and I have been raised to new life in Jesus Christ. So just as Jesus Christ is spiritually alive, I am spiritually alive, all right? Really, really, really important. Recognize your resurrection with Christ as an accomplished fact. Does that make any sense? Nod, nod. Any questions about that? That makes sense? Okay. 
All right, the second thing that Paul talks about here in these four four verses is this, and I've tried to summarize it. He says, replicate the character of Jesus. All right, so, so we're talking about sanctification. So in order for me to grow in my relationship, I need to realize who I am in Christ, and then I need to replicate the character of Jesus. And notice how Paul says this in the passage. He says, since you have been raised with Christ, a fact, seek those things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. So here's what Paul does. Paul mentions two ways in which believers apply the character qualities of Jesus to our lives or to our life. The first is this. It's just a a direct quote. Seek the things that are above. All right, so, so here's what Paul's saying. You're a follower of Christ. You died with Christ. You've resurrected with Christ. So here's what your responsibility is. Seek those things which are above. It's interesting, the word seek is found in the present tense. It conveys the idea of continuous action. All right, sometimes, the, here's what we want as believers. We want to be able to do something, put it in the pocket, and not have to worry about it anymore. And, and that's the way our salvation is. So, 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 so how many times are we saved? One time, right? We don't need to wake up and do that all over again. But this idea of seeking God is something that should be a continuous action in our lives. And, and the verb tense that Paul uses is really, really clear. It's a present verb tense. He says, actually, what it's saying is continue seeking the things that are above. So the idea is to keep seeking. And so we ask the question then, what are we to seek? And he answers the question, seek those things that are above. Now, let me just say, Paul's not speaking of, of, of mysticism. He's not speaking of some esoteric lifestyle, you know, some heavenly woo, lifestyle. That's not what he's talking about. He is encouraging us to govern our earthly actions with a heavenly reality all right so so here's what he's saying you're a citizen of heaven (laughs) you you are right now in this moment a citizen of the kingdom and so since you are a citizen of the kingdom he's saying begin to think and begin to seek things as a citizen of the kingdom so in other words to be preoccupied with the things of heaven is to be preoccupied with the one who lives in heaven okay when we say that who are we speaking of jesus all right and so when i seek those things that are above what am i doing i'm replicating the character of jesus in my life it's also by the way to view the things of earth people events and places through jesus's eyes to be able to say okay god help me to see the circumstances through your eyes with a heavenly perspective vicky vicky sings the song um i wish she was here I, i'm gonna sing a little bit for you but it's not gonna sound near as good as when vicky sings it so she sings the song let me see this world dear lord as though i were looking through your eyes that's exactly what paul is talking about here so here we are kingdom citizens living on earth and yet the challenge for us is to live today with a heavenly perspective now that's tough is it is it not so we get in traffic in the morning and everybody's cutting us off and and we left about 10 minutes late and so we're in a hurry and we hit every single light along the way can anybody feel me that happens to me on a regular basis and so all of a sudden and and I'm wanting to speed through and the person in front of me is going really slow and I think I can make that light but they're going so slow that I don't make that light and all of a sudden I'm frustrated because I'm going to be late for a meeting what am I supposed to do at that moment I'm supposed to see what is taking place, not from an earthly perspective, but from a kingdom perspective. He says, seek those things which are above. He says the second thing, which is pretty synonymous. He says, set your mind 
on things that are above. So, so remember, the, the, he, he's saying, if you're a follower of Christ, this should be what's happening in your life. Seek those things which are above and set your mind on things that are above. The, the word set there could, could actually be translated think. And once again, it's in the present tense. It talks about a continuous action. Uh, the commentator Lightfoot said this, you must not only seek heaven, I like this, you must think heaven. That, that's what he means in the passage. You're not only seeking heaven, but you are thinking heaven. I tried to th- think of a way to illustrate this, and so I'm not, I'm not really good at some of these illustrations, but, but just as everybody, does anybody know how to use a compass? All right, so, 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 so a compass is always oriented towards one direction. What direction? A compass is oriented where? North. All right, so, so, so it's all, uh, a compass is oriented towards the true north. All right, that, that's how a compass works. So just as a compass, it functions because it's oriented towards the true north. So our whole way of thinking and acting should orient itself towards heaven. That's exactly what Paul is saying in the, in the passage. So here's what he means practically. So when heavenly values and Christ-like thoughts dominate our mind, your actions change. Does that make sense? So so, so when all of a sudden we're we're seeking the things uh, that are above, we're setting our mind on things that are above, what happens? Actions change. So, so, So we can flip that around. So what happens as a believer when I'm not seeking those things that are above, when I'm not setting my mind on spiritual things, I revert back to what? All of a sudden that default setting comes in and I act like the old Brian and I respond like the old Brian. Why is that? Because I'm not focusing on what I need to focus on. And... and, it always responds. So what we're putting, what, what we're allowing our mind and heart to dwell on is what comes out in our actions. You guys have heard the saying what? What's down in the well, what? Come on, somebody knows that saying, right? What's in the well comes up in the bucket. Has anybody heard that before? Has nobody heard that before? Yeah. What's down in the well comes up in the bucket. Have you heard, Terry, have you heard that? Yeah. You haven't heard it either. Good grief. Is that like a Canton, Ohio saying or something like that? So, Midwestern say, what is it? What did you say, Greg? It's a Brian Burkholder. No, it's actually, it's a Norma Burkholder saying. My mom used to give that to me all the time. What's the idea? Whatever's down in the well is going to come up in the bucket. You're not going to pull something up in the bucket that's not down in the well. All right? So, So the idea being in our mind, if we're saturating our mind and our hearts with the things of God, if we're dwelling on heaven, if we're doing that, what's that going to result in? Our actions. So, so, so instead of earthly actions, we're going to have heavenly actions. And, and the, it, it, it's so simplistic yet profound that we don't grasp a hold of it. Because as we've already talked about tonight, because of our busyness, because of all the things, we don't spend time dwelling on the things of God. We dwell on all the chaos around us. And we wonder why our actions are not changing. So Paul says this, since you've been resurrected with Christ, (laughs) all right, seek those things which are above. Set your mind on things that are above. And then in verse 4, he makes that great statement. I love that. When Christ, who is your life? If I asked you, and we know the answer, but if I asked you, what one word would define your life? What would it be? I mean, we could have a lot. And, 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 and sometimes it's not even, it's good stuff. I'm afraid sometimes my life would be ministry or Hollywood Community Church. Or uh, I would, if Vicki was here, I would say Vicki or, you, you know, all of that. And so all of those are good things, but, but our focus, if we're not careful, We take our eyes off of heaven, off of who we are, off of the kingdom, off of all of those things, and something else becomes our life. 
Now, now, now the idea is not that we sell everything we have, go wait on a mountaintop for, for Jesus to come back. That's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about to live our lives with a kingdom focus. That is the essence of sanctification from a practical point of view. To sit back and say, okay, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the time to sit in your presence. I'm going to readjust my mind. Do, do you ever feel like you need this? I feel like every morning, so, so without becoming too personal and transparent, my time with the Lord is really early in the morning. So I got to get up really early in order to do everything I need to do in order to be here at the office by a certain time. And I feel like in the mornings I get up and I have to reorient my mind. It's almost like, during the day, you know, my mind has come off of true north and it's kind of been, you know, kind of been, you know, deflected in different areas. And I've got to get up in the morning and I've got to reorient myself to that. And, and I find in my own life that if I don't take the time to reorient myself, that I'm going to have struggles throughout the day. I'm not going to lose my salvation, you, you, you know, any of those things, but I'm going to struggle keeping my mind, my heart, and my actions the way they ought to be. That's what Paul is talking about here. All right, let's continue. Verses 5 through 9. So the first thing he says is this, live the risen life. Live who you are. The second thing he says is this, put sin to death. So let's read verses 5 through 9. He says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talking from your mouth. Don't lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge. I love this. It ties right into what we're talking about. After what? After the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all in all. All right, so let's summarize it. I just want you to walk away with four truths today. The first is this, live the risen life. The second is this, put sin to death. Now, now let me explain this because at first it might seem contradictory to what we've been talking about because didn't Paul already say that we've been crucified with Christ? And if we've been crucified with Christ and we're risen with Christ, and we're living the victorious life, what does it mean that I need to put sin to death? So this is a common statement that Paul makes. So here's another verse. It might be in your outline. I'm not sure. Romans chapter 6 and verse 6. Paul says the same thing. He says, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. All right, so, so here's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying this. The reality of our position in Christ, who we are, crucified, resurrected, must be worked out in the believer's practical living. Okay? So this is who we are positionally. That's got to be worked out practically in our lives. We say it this way sometimes. We've died to sin's penalty, but that doesn't mean that sin no longer has any effect in our lives. Sin is still potent, is it not? So, so, so we can't, you know, look over at it and say, you know, nah, 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 you can't affect me anymore, right? It, it does, all right? Sin is still potent in our lives. In order to have the victory over it, We must claim the Holy Spirit's power. That's what Paul is talking about. So here's a verse. Write this down. Um, uh, um, Zechariah says this in the Old Testament. Zechariah 4, 6. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Or says the Lord. So so here's here's the idea. So we can only do, 
what Paul is challenging us to do here through the power of the Holy Spirit of God. It's not something that we can fabricate. Let me, let me uh, read this quote to you. And I can give all of these things to you if you guys would want them. Richard Baxter, who was an, an old Puritan preacher, made this statement. He says, Use sin as it will use you. Spare it not, for it will not spare you. It is your murderer and the murderer of the world. Use it, therefore, as a murderer should be used. Kill it before it kills you. And though it bring you to the grace or to the grave, excuse me, as it did your head, it shall not be able to keep you there. All right. I love reading some of the Puritan preachers, all right? Basically what he's talking about, he's talking about this, that we need to treat sin as a murderer. What do you do with a murderer? Genesis chapter 9 and verse 6, all right? A murderer is what? Should be put to death. He says, treat sin that way. And, and so the idea that he's saying is this, if you're following along in your outlines, kill what is earthly in you, all right? Kill what is earthly in you. Because we have been risen with Christ, we should make a decisive and a definitive resolution to overcome our sinful temptations and habits by bringing our flesh under the subjection and the control of the Holy Spirit of God. So so let me ask you a question. Let's talk about this for a second, all right? I I want this to be practical. Why is it that uh, as believers we tend to do what we don't want to do, all right? So, so imagine, I don't want anybody to confess today, so imagine the sin that you struggle with the most, all right? You, you have that sin in your mind? Don't tell anybody what it is. You have that sin in your mind? Why is it that you seem to struggle with that sin over and over and over again, even though you say that you want to overcome it? Why is that? Pardon? There are human instincts. There are in that. So you do. So Greg is right. So we have within us, we have a spiritual nature and we still have a physical carnal nature. And Paul talks about that these two natures fight against each other on a regular basis. You experience it, right? The, the, this internal fighting. I, I mean, you know, cartoon-wise, they've illustrated it as if an angel on this shoulder and a demon on this shoulder, right? And they're constantly fighting with each other, all right? That's a humorous way to illustrate it, but that, but that illustrates the tension that goes on in our lives. So we have this physical nature, this carnal, sinful nature that's alive within us, all right? And we have, at the same time, we have the Holy Spirit of God living within us, all right? Who has already sealed us, who has already granted us victory. And so what is the difference? Why is it that we give in to these temptations, whatever they are, whenever we have the infinite, omnipotent power of the Holy Spirit of God living within us. Because we're not surrendering. So we've already looked at this in previous verses because Paul says in in Romans chapter 7 and other places, he said, you are servants to whom you obey. And so the the idea is this, to whom are we submitting? Right? If we submit to the flesh, the flesh is going to have victory over us. And even though the omnipotent power of God is living within us, at that moment we submit to that carnal side of us and we don't surrender to the Holy Spirit of God. Paul talks about it in Romans chapter 7. Paul gives us his testimony and there's some debate as if it's uh, if it's a uh, a pre-conversion testimony of Paul or a post-conversion testimony of Paul. But Paul says this, you know the passage. He says, the things that I know I shouldn't do, I do. And the things that I don't, or, 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 I always get this confused. The things that I know I shouldn't do, I do. And the things that I know I should do, I don't do. 
And he makes this statement, what a miserable man I am. So what's Paul talking about? That tension within him. And so that exists. And so Paul is saying this. He said, listen, because we've been risen with Christ, we need to make a definitive resolution to surrender ourselves each and every day to the control of the Holy Spirit of God. It's interesting, through the years, people have misrepresented Paul's words. And instead of surrender, they've reverted back to what we talked about last week, asceticism. So they've sat back and said, okay, I've got to bring this under control. Let me just give you a a couple of graphic examples. And I I don't want to be too graphic, but Origen, if you've heard of Origen, one of the great church fathers, Origen, he was so... uh, convicted about this and so convicted about he's got to bring his body under subjection that he actually took the teaching of Matthew chapter 19 and verse 12 where Jesus talks about some men are eunuchs and some men make themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of God. Origen took that to such an extreme that he voluntarily castrated himself so that he wouldn't fall into any sexual sins. And his idea of following Christ was to take this huge physical leap and say, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to eliminate any possibility of doing this. Man, that's not what Paul is talking about in the passage. The flagellants from the Middle Ages scourged themselves. They actually took scourges and they would walk and they would scourge themselves and beat themselves over and over again in their minds trying to kill the flesh. That's not what Paul is commanding us to do. Rather, he's calling under the Holy Spirit's control for the elimination of everything in the believer's life that's contrary to godliness. He gives us a list here, and you can see it in front of you. He talks about sexual immorality. It's the word from which we get our word pornography. It refers to any form of illicit sex. He uses the word impurity. It's an interesting word. It comes from the word from which we get our word catharsis. And it goes beyond the act to the evil thoughts beyond the act. He talks about passions and evil desires, which are synonymous words. Passion is the physical side of the action, while evil desire is the mental side of the action. And it's interesting. So in that list of what we would call despicable sexual sins, he mentions covetousness which we might sit back and say, ah, that one's not that bad, (laughs) right? Covetousness is an insatiable desire to have more. And most believe that Paul mentions that because that's the root cause of all sin. And then he summarizes, he said, in covetousness, which is adultery. By the way, I would say this, that the, or or somebody tell me, does anybody know what what the opposite of covetousness is? So, So what would be the antonym of covetousness, covet, I can't even say that, covetousness. Does anybody know what would be the antonym of that? Contentment. Contentment. Your contentment, what did you say, Ray? Generosity. Generosity, I think, is the, is the result of contentment. I think contentment is the result of that because covetousness is the idea, I'm not satisfied until I have more. Contentment is the idea that I'm satisfied with what God gives me. With every whether it's a lot or whether it's a little. A content person will not attempt to violate another person or covet something that someone else owns. Someone said it this way, the greedy person worships himself while the contented person worships God. And so he says what? Kill the sin. He says a second thing, and I know our time is going to get away. He says this, take off what is wicked. Um, Let me find the verse. I didn't put it right in front of me, but he talks about take off that which is wicked. Verse 9, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with his old practices. The the word picture that Paul uses paints the picture of taking off your clothes. Just as a person takes off their dirty clothes at the end of the day, so we should discard under the Holy Spirit's power that filthy and tattered habits of our former life. 
For some reason, I was thinking as I was reading through this of some of these songs we sang as a kid. So we used to sing this song. See if anybody else sang this. Uh, you, you guys might have sang this at First Baptist of West Hollywood years ago. Our youth group used to sing this. Oh, the best thing in my life I ever did do. Oh, the best thing in my life I ever did do. Oh, the best thing in my life I ever did do was take off the old robe and put on the new. Anybody else hear that before? Oh, the old robe was dirty, all tattered and torn but the new robe was spotless and never been worn. Anyways, there you go. That's actually on video. You can watch that later on. That's what Paul is talking about in the passage. He says, take off that. And he mentions, and we won't go through this list. And so let me ask you for a second. Let's just pause for a second and give glory to God. What, what are some things that God, through his power, has enabled you to take off since you've become a follower of Jesus Christ. Can anybody mention anything? Anger? Anger? Something that, 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 that was something you wore on a regular basis, but through the power of the Holy Spirit, you've been able to take that off, and it's not something that you wear regularly anymore. Can anybody mention anything else? What's that? Unworthiness. Unworthiness. Now we're getting deep and profound with that. What's that? I'm sorry? Oh, absolutely. Control. Control. Yeah. I mean, I mean, we really can mention anything that dominated us before. I think one of the joys of the Christian life and, and, and one of the things that help us to really measure our growth is to be able to sit back and say, boy, by God's grace, that used to be something that dominated me, but it doesn't dominate me anymore. I've been able to disrobe of that I've been able to take that off, just like a dirty pair of tattered clothes. I've been able to take it off and by God's grace not put it on anymore. Well, here's the second part of that question that's really introspective, all right? What is something in your life right now that you need to discard? Don't answer the question. I'm not asking anybody to answer the question. What is something in your life right now that you need to discard? I would venture to say, remember in the very beginning we prayed that the Holy Spirit of God would speak to us? I venture to say that right now he's talking to you like he is to me. And there's something in your life that he's pinpointed and said, you know, this is something that through my power that you need to surrender and you need to take off. Sometimes we don't admit that and sometimes we, we just like it and we give into it on a regular basis. Paul says, take it off. Let me show you the third thing. All right, the third thing he says is this. Put on the new man. So he says, take off the old self. Put on the new man. We just alluded to it in the song there. In verses 10 through 14, he says, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised. Verse 12, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all, put on love, which binds everything together, in perfect harmony. So what's Paul talking about? He's talking about the new man. That's what he alludes to in 2 Corinthians 5.17. If anybody's in Christ, he's what? He's a new creation. Old things are passed away. All of us are become new. So, 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 so here's the theological aspect of this. All of us are either in Christ or in Adam. So, so every single person alive is either in Christ. So Paul says, if anybody is in Christ, so who are in Christ? Believers were in Christ, right? So, so, so from, from a theological perspective, every single person on the planet is either in Christ or in Adam. There is no middle ground. The Puritan Thomas Goodwin said this. He said, there are but two men that are seen standing before God, Adam and Jesus Christ. And these two men have all other men hanging 
at their girdles. Uh, obviously, you know, that was written a long time ago because he used the term girdle right there. All right? So, so, so what's he talking about? That we're either in Christ or we are in Adam. So here's what Paul says. Because we've been risen with Christ, because we are in Christ, put on the new man. Thank you, Joe. Um, and, and we could walk through these verses for time's sake. I'm not going to do it. Verse 10, he talks about there's a new quality of life. He talks about the fact, um, he says, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of the creator. So if you're writing your outlines, the next thing I wrote is this. The process of renewal, in parentheses, sanctification, brings increased knowledge. And so as we grow, we are, we, are, we are learning more and more about who we are and who Jesus is and who God wants us to be. The, this older theologian said this. I love this phrase. He said, when, his, when a man is led through the waters of salvation, they are ankle deep at first, but as he progresses, they become knee deep and reach to the loins and are finally impassable by swimming. What's he talking about? That when we first come to Christ, man, there's just these simple truths that are ankle deep that we can comprehend. But as we grow, what? what? We're, we're being renewed in knowledge, and it becomes more profound and more profound and more profound. Verse 11, he talks about the fact that we're all the same in Christ. Just as the individual has changed, so there are implications from the church. The church puts off the old barriers that separated us. There's no place for racial barriers or cultural snobbery. Here's the thing that I wrote in my notes. God has united all believers in Christ Jesus. Then verses 12 through 14, man, I'm bringing all this to an end real quick. Verses 12 through 14, we summarize it this way. We're to put on the character qualities that are found in Jesus. Compassionate hearts, which means an emotional caring relationship with those who are hurting. Kindness, readiness to do good. Humility, which is a posture of servanthood. Meekness, which is gentleness and encouraging others to change their lives. Patience, a willingness to take as long as necessary to minister in the lives of others. And then forgiveness. So, so, so here's a great thing, practically. So as you wake up in the morning and you're spending time with the Lord, on a daily basis you sit back and you say, okay, God, here's the things that I struggle with. So Lord, today I confess those things. And this morning, I surrender myself to the power of the Holy Spirit of God who's in me. I recognize the fact that my old self was crucified. I claim that. I recognize the fact that I am a new believer in Jesus Christ, resurrected. I claim that. And so today, by your faith, here's what I'm asking, or, or by faith in you, I'm asking this. I'm asking for those character qualities of Jesus to demonstrate themselves in my life. So God, today, give me a compassionate heart. God, today, give me kindness. Today, give me meekness. Give me humility. And he mentions the most difficult one last. He says, and help me to be forgiving. And then he tells us why. He says, because you have been forgiven in Christ Jesus. I read a great quote from uh, Facebook the other day. I I usually don't use Facebook as a quote, but I found this quote. I don't know who wrote it or where. I saw it, went through it, and then couldn't find it again. But it was basically this idea. When it comes to forgiveness, it's always your turn. (laughs) Think about that for a second. When it comes to forgiveness, it's always your turn. We can sit back and think of a hundred reasons why we shouldn't forgive anybody but we don't forgive people because they deserve it. We forgive them because we are forgiven in Christ Jesus when we didn't deserve it. And it's only through his power that we are able to be forgiving. The fourth thing I wrote is this, and I'm gonna give it to you and then I'm gonna let you study it. Live differently. Live differently. Verses 15, 16, and 17, he says this, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. 
Verse 16 is a great verse. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching, admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing songs and hymns and spiritual psalms with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So three things I'm going to give them to you. The first is this. Let Christ's peace rule in your heart. The peace that Paul mentions here is unity. It's the fulfillment of the previous verses. It's really talking about living at peace with one another. So let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. The second thing, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Where dwell means live, be at home. So Paul is calling for the word of God to take residence and be at home in our lives. Allowing God's word to dwell in your heart produces worship, thankfulness, which is what he talks about in the passage. And then he says this, let the name of Christ define your actions. Let the name of Christ define your actions. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. It's amazing that, sometimes I'm amazed that, that, that my boys turned out the way they did and it's only through the grace of God that both of them were in ministry because we used to put so many expectations on them I mean we'd be on the way to church and almost every Sunday we'd look at him and say now remember who you are all right you're the pastor's son so I expect you to act like it all right I don't think I would do that today but I did that back then and I kind of regret it you know and so thankfully they didn't rebel from it they actually turned out well thankfully through his grace but I But to a certain degree, that's what Paul is saying to us. Remember whose you are. And he's saying, let your actions, your deeds, everything that you do be done in what? The name of Jesus Christ. All right, so we walk through a lot. I kind of wanted to walk through that passage because that's a pretty profound passage on sanctification, and I wanted you to see that passage. I'd encourage you during the next week to take that passage and read through it three or four times. So, so, so just a warning of what it's not, and then we'll say what it is, and we'll, and we'll pray, all right? Once again, it's not you deciding, okay, I'm going to stop doing these things. So from now on, I'm not going to do these things, and I'm going to start doing these things, because you can't do it on your own but it's a recognition of the fact that that's who God has made you to be. And you claim who you are in Jesus Christ. And you surrender yourself to the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And you ask him by faith to produce those things in your life. It's amazing, even in my life, and I'm not talking about a long time ago. I should have learned this a long time ago. But even recently, it's amazing as I see God working in my life, that when I stop trying so hard and I surrender to him to see him begin to change me in ways that I could never change myself. That's what he wants to do in our lives. He wants to put on that new self in our lives. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the truth of your word. Lord, this is is deep stuff. Father, we realize that there's no rules or regulations that are going to that are going to have victory over the indulgences of the flesh. It can't be done. But since we have been risen with Christ, since the victory is already ours, the old self has been crucified, and we are alive in Christ Jesus, help us to realize who we are in Christ, to seek those things that are above, to spend time with Him, and allow His words to saturate our mind and our heart. And as a result, help us to replicate the attitudes and the actions of Jesus Christ. Mold us and shape us into your image for which we were created. Help us to fulfill that. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.